This program contains graphic images and discussion of medical procedures. Viewer discretion is advised. Renee is uh, a very popular speaker at the Advances in Pediatrics course at UCSF, professor of dermatology at UC and director of the UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital Oakland Dermatology Service, and I think we see you have taught no Noemi very well. So um, she is going to speak on dermatologic conditions in other developmental disabilities. Welcome. Thank you, Lucy. And you can all see uh, Noemi's a star student. And we have many joint consultations. Uh, we do admit many of them are by text message, but we also use the EPIC system and um, staff messaging to consult back and forth. Um, it's been really fun working with her. And um, we divided up the Down syndrome um, skin problems with those that other children with development and disability face um, because she does run the Down syndrome clinic and she's learned a lot about those specific skin problems to that population and I learned a lot from her as well. So it's been really fun. When I thought about what I seen at Children's Hospital Oakland, I've been there now for three years doing referral, academic, pediatric, um, inpatient and outpatient, it ended up dividing up into uh, four categories. First, I want to let you know I have no disclosures, any products I find, they're random shots from the internet, and I have no personal stake in Amazon, which I did, but um, it's just a place that a lot of families shop, so if you see that, that's why I um, use it. We're starting with some visual relief here and a moment of meditation. Hiking on Mount Tam in February, I was able to photograph snow, which was really fun. So everybody sigh and think about being up there. Okay. So I divided up what, um, the problems that I manage and that we all manage in our clinics into sort of four categories. Some of these are more common than others. I like to start with the common things, which are the big um, five diseases we see in Durham Clinic, eczema, acne, et cetera, warts, and molluscum. These are things you manage even more than I do because they are common. I was talking with one of the audience members about how many kids that they see day to day with skin problems they deal with even if they come in for primary care. But those children with developmental disabilities have special challenges when you're managing common skin problems. Even just an average acne patient can, can have special challenges that we'll discuss. And I want to give you some take-home clues and trip, uh, tricks and tips that you can use in your own practice. Also, many patients with developmental disability have uh, behaviors that affect the skin, hair, and nails. So we're going to talk about those. Nutritional deficiency is a more rare problem that we see, but the skin can be a window into diagnosing that. And in our inpatient service, we have had more than a couple patients in the last three years who manifest with nutritional deficiency in the skin. And also in my outpatient clinic, I saw one that I'll show you. Um, and that was in one case of an inpatient neglect. Um, so that was a very sad case. Likewise, uh, your children, your infants, your babies with developmental disability who are manifesting neurological issues, you may have the skin as a window into a genetic diagnosis. I'm going to focus today on hypopigmentation. So to go over our learning objectives, we're going to start with the five common skin diseases and give you some tips and tricks for management in this population. Then we're going to go on to the body-focused repetitive behaviors, the skin pulling and hair pulling and nail disorders. We're going to talk about two nutritional disorders in the skin manifestations and finally learn an approach to an infant with developmental disability and hypopigmentation. Okay, so let's start with common things being common. Atopic dermatitis, my number one diagnosis that I see in my clinic in Oakland it is a referral-based clinic. I see very severe atopic dermatitis, including in children with developmental disability. These legs belong to an eight-year-old who has autism spectrum disorder. He's extremely uncomfortable. He is digging and picking his skin all day long, and we'll talk more about him in a moment. I see a lot of patients with acne, and it's a chance to think about agency and independence in our adolescents. Warts and molluscum, when the family are bothered by the lesions more than the child, and maybe the child doesn't want a painful procedure, that can be a challenge. Scalp psoriasis is extremely common. Noemi talked about that a little bit, but I see kids who's Scalp itching does uh, exacerbate their behavioral problems. And finally, talk a bit about dermatologic procedures. 
So what about the link between ATP and autism spectrum disorder? Um, I haven't seen evidence that really convinces me that ATP predisposes to autism spectrum disorder. There are some studies that propose a link, but I didn't think the data was very convincing. They're both extremely common, and um, just because they're together doesn't mean they're um, causative. One is causative to the other. What we do know is that children who have autism spectrum disorder and then are sleep deprived because of their atopic derm, it can make their behavior problems worse, and that's true in all children, of course. Um, so we don't know whether atopic dermatitis is more prevalent in this population. There's some studies that say it is and others that say it isn't. So that's an open question at this point. The tactile sensory dysfunction, of course, exacerbates the itch, the perception of itch, the experience of itch, and the behavioral response to itch. So where one child might rub their skin, um, my patient here, like many uh, patients um, with uh, developmental disability tend to pick and dig at the skin, which is much more um, hard to heal and hard to treat. It can increase agitation, increase, um, of course, sleep disruption, which also can increase behavioral problems, and then you will get super infection. So our friend here had a um, methicillin-sensitive staph aureus infection that I, I cultured and then worked with the parents to eliminate that and that did help the eczema as well. Parents are already overwhelmed. You saw that diagram that Noemi showed with all the things they have to do, and here is this chronic skin problem that adds 45 minutes a day to the care. So I try to make it easy for them and for the child who may resist all topical applications of any kind, and Noemi mentioned that as well. I'm asking them to use greasy, thick moisturizers. It is not a pleasant sensation, especially the older kids really resist it. So I work with the families, I compromise on my ointments, and I compromise and allow them to use creams, and if I have to, lotions, which are much easier to put on and much less effective at treating the dry skin. But I do believe that I need to make the whole situation palatable and workable and practical for the family. I will tend to use a stronger topical steroid once a day instead of a mid-potency topical steroid twice a day. It's another compromise. So I'll use a cream, and I'll go up a class or two on my topical steroid strength in order to have this be a bedtime routine after the bath or shower instead of having the family having to deal with us in the morning, trying to get, get the kid out the door to school. So we all know how hard that is. And then remember that topical steroids do come in gels and solutions for the scalp. Solutions that are alcohol-based can sting, and the child may resist them, but gels tend to be not as stingy. So remember that. You can look up and see if there's a gel that you can use in your uh, pharmacy formulary. You work with the parents, and the primary care rely on you to also work with the parents to um, work with the child's personality, temperament, and behavior issues, give them rewards for doing the skin care, and then if it's a teenager who wants to use the smelly skin care products at Noemi, uh, mentioned, I particularly will mention um, Axe, which the boys love. Try to just keep those products out of the house so the kids can't use them because they're very irritating. So let's talk about itch. How can we um, break the itch, scratch, dig, pick infection cycle in our patients? I address staph super infection aggressively. Again, I like to apologize to Brian Lee, who is our infection. Um, infectious disease specialist in our hospital who's always trying to get us not to use antibiotics. I get that and I try really hard not to, but sometimes you just have to use systemic antibiotics. So the amount of staph on the skin overwhelms me Pearson and bleach baths. And in order to get the eczema under control, I do culture because the patients that I see are referred and severe and I need data. So I do tend to culture them more than you would and direct the staph infection systemic therapy toward MSSA, MRSA, et cetera. Phototherapy is a tool that I'm trying to start at Children's. I have a grant in. Anybody who knows anybody on the President's Innovation Fund grant committee, can you wave to them? Um, because we really need phototherapy. This is a health disparity issue for our patients. And what phototherapy does for you is it drives the immune system out of the skin and immediately helps the itch, and it helps the skin heal in the case of atopic dermatitis. Systemic therapies such as dupilumab, as of two days ago, are now FDA approved down to 12 years of age. So we're extremely excited about this. And it is a drug we can use in this population. It's not immunosuppressive like all of our other medications. Occlusion is great, but if you have a kid who has sensory issues, they are not going to want their legs wrapped. But if you do have a kid who will tolerate it, you can get these beautiful, colorful Coban wraps or other brands online for pretty cheap and pretty colors and you can wrap the legs and keep the fingers off the wounds and allow them to heal. You can also, for a localized lesion, use a duoderm, which is a venous stasis ulcer dressing, no stock in that company, 
or any kind of a uh, stick but not adhesive dressing wrapped with an ace bandage and then take a derm. We, uh, yesterday you heard a little bit how uh, antihistamines, sedating antihistamines can be pro problematic in kids with behavioral problems. Uh, I second that and it can lower seizure threshold, but if they don't have those issues, they don't have paradoxical reactions or seizure disorder, uh, uh, one per kilo hydroxyzine at bedtime or Benadryl at bedtime can really help during a flare. I don't use them chronically unless I absolutely have to. So here's the culture from um, our friend here with the MSSA. So that's a little bit about eczema. Let's move on to acne. Acne is challenging to treat in um, all ages and um, children of all abilities. Um, in the teenage population, we have issues with autonomy and therapeutic decision making. Um, the caregivers as advocates, this, this child came in to me having seen an adult dermatologist who thought they were pretty much done treating her acne. Um, and I want to know how many people in this room had acne as teenagers. So it's not just a cosmetic problem, it is uncomfortable, it hurts, and this mother was advocating for her child to have more aggressive therapy, and we teamed up, and you'll see what we, what we did for her ultimately, but she could not get um, access to dermatology in her community, and she drove a, a ways to see me. Um, there's pain, there's scarring, there's disfigurement, and these are true issues that need to be treated seriously. It's not just, quote, cosmetic. But there is a problem with access to care, to dermatology, specialty care. Um, I know that there's some teledermatology businesses that are addressing this for some of the clinics, FQHCs. Um, but I tr we do our best to, to help you take care of these patients one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So this is the handout that our ER gave to one of our patients saying, talk to your doctor about a possible dermatology skin specialist referral. Um, below is a listing of Bay Area dermatologists, and you see that it's just me. So. <laughs> I am happy to tell you that this Dr. Kittler, who's wonderful, is on my team now as of October, and I have a wonderful PA, Angelie uh, Washington, I work with, and she sees a lot of the older kids and a lot of the acne under my supervision, and she's excellent. So we are growing, and we're doing our best to help you. So we tried to write isotretinoin or Accutane for this child. We did the pregnancy test. Um, we did put her on the birth control pill as required by the system, and um, we thought it might help her acne. It was repeatedly denied by her medical h and And again, I consider this a health disparity problem. I have uh, real difficulties getting drugs I use in patients with uh, private insurance with my government-insured patients. Fortunately for our young lady, we added aldactone as a anti-androgen to her birth control pill, and lo and behold, she was much helped by this, and she was able to use topicals. She didn't resist that at all and was very compliant with our Retin-A. We were able to go up on strength. So we marched through all the steps that you see here, here before we finally controlled her acne, and mom and she are happy, and I just got a referral request for the aldactone, so she's doing very well now a year later. She never ended up taking Accutane. <laughs> So some workarounds for you for patients with government insurance, because much of this population does have government insurance. Um, you can get an over-the-counter benzoyl peroxide gel that's really nice, water-based. You see there it's $20. That'll last about a month or two. Um, and you don't have to get the $50 proactive. They are paying mostly for their telemarketing and their advertising, and we don't want to support that. Um, over-the-counter adapalene, I call it kit, uh, baby Retin-A. It, it, it works like Retin-A, but it's more it's easier to use and it's better tolerated. You can get that online for about $14 or in your local drugstore. Um, you all can use doxycycline for inflammatory acne or bad truncal acne. It's, it, the monohydrate is not as irritating to the GI tract. They can take it once a day with dinner. Of course, you want dairy products separated about a half an hour um, from that pill. And then for girls that are in the <clears throat> older teen group, oral contraceptives are wonderful. If you don't feel comfortable using aldactone, you can refer and we can get them started and then we can treat them jointly. You can't use aldactone without good birth control because of the risk of teratogenicity and um, feminizing a masculine fetus. We all love warts, right? Don't you just love when a patient comes in with 5,000 warts? And the parents, this is my favorite line from parents. In my career, they walk in, they point to the kid, and they say, we want these gone. The implication being, I don't, right? The problem is, freezing is really painful. Um, curetting is painful. I will not do freezing and curetting for warts and molluscum without the permission of the child. If the child is not going to ask me to treat these with a painful procedure, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to tell them it doesn't hurt because it does. How many people have had a wart frozen? It hurts. So you need to, what? 
It's worth it. If the kid is in pain, I will do it. If they can't walk because they have a painful wart. But I have to tell you in studies, if you've had a wart more than a year, it takes six to seven separate liquid nitrogen treatments. And that's going to make the kid hate the doctor. And not just me, they're going to hate you too. So I won't do it. Um, I have other tricks, but it does require referral to me for those. What you can do is salicylic acid with duct tape, tape occlusion. If the child resists filing and pairing at home, duct tape will pull off the top of the wart and in time will help you um, irritate the wart and get rid of it. You have to educate families. It's a viral infection. It's not like a mole or skin tag you can just cut off. You can't cut out warts. It's an infection. There's HPV in the skin around the wart. If you cut off the wart, the HPV will activate around it, and you'll end up with a bigger wart. So don't send your plantar warts to podiatry for surgery. That's a myth, okay? Your work around sal acid duct tape. You, if you have cantharone in your office, you can use it on small warts. Sometimes they do get bigger instead of smaller, but it's worth a try. And then imiquimod, some um, insurance plans cover imiquimod, which is immune stimulant. It's something to do. I'm not sure there's great data supporting its use for warts and molluscum, but I don't have an objection to it. I do squaric acid, which is immunotherapy in my office. Um, it's painless. It's somewhat risky in terms of causing a severe uh, allergic reaction in the skin, but that's what I use for my kids with periungal warts. This child here, we did squaric acid twice and he cleared up. Okay, so you see that scalp down there belonged to an adolescent with autism spectrum disorder. Uh, he was extremely agitated by the itching. He was head banging. He was hitting his head. His caregiver was very distressed. He had a wonderful, dedicated caregiver. Um, and she brought him in uh, repeatedly. I cultured his scalp looking for tinea because it was in some group um, situations, classrooms, et cetera. It was negative. So we went on to topical steroids, to tar, some of the things that Noemi mentioned. Why do we use ketoconyl? Conazole shampoo and seborrheic dermatitis, because it's an inflammatory response to a normal pitoriform colonization post-puberty. So we like to reduce how much fungus is on the scalp. It's not an infection with fungus. We did rule a dermatophyte infection out with a culture. But if you want to start 2% ketoconazole, or if you don't have access to that, 1% over-the-counter ketoconazole shampoo twice a week, it's a great tool. And then the other days a week, if the kids got short hair and can wash their hair every day, it is helpful for sebderm, just hair washing every day. The days you don't use the, the uh, ketoconazole shampoo, you can use any dander shampoo. I happen to like tar. Many of these patients also have psoriasis, and tar is really good for both psoriasis and sebderm. And the ketoconazole doesn't help, hurt if there's psoriasis. It might help, but it um, really helps for the sebderm. The topical steroids, you need to use a stronger one. The scalp is thick. You won't get into trouble with the stronger topical steroid, like a class 2 light X, something like that. And then you can layer the tar, the topical steroid, the salicylic acid, and do combination therapy. Scalp psoriasis usually does require help from us because it's really stubborn and hard to treat. Moving on to procedures. So we do a lot of procedures in Derm, Pete's Derm Clinic, biopsies, the wart and molluscum procedures I mentioned. And my colleague here, Vikash Oza, is a pediatric dermatologist at NYU. He trained with us at UCSF, and I'm very proud of him. He gives a talk at the National Dermatology Meeting to adult dermatologists about how to treat kids appropriately with developmental disability in their derm clinics and tries to teach them about doing procedures, things that all come intuitively to us as pediatricians. Adult dermatologists may not have good training. They may not have had Alona Frieden as their derm teacher or, or Kelly Cordero or Aaron Mathis or I or anyone else. Um, I think you all know that pediatric dermatologists are your friends when it comes to treating kids with developmental disability. We'll tell and show and do. Even if we can't get consent from the child, we'll get assent and also from the, the family. We use a lot of lidocaine cream under occlusion to uh, localize lesions. And then distraction, physical distraction with ice or the buzzy bee, you see there. Um, and then also the shot blocker, which is the little prongy thing. A uh, child who has sensory issues may not tolerate that, but um, it might be more helpful in, in others. Um, and then some distraction with headphones and screen time. As long as the kid knows what's coming, it can be helpful. I don't sneak up on any kid. So I'd like to talk to him first if I can. All right, we're going to talk about body-focused repetitive behaviors. The language around these issues has evolved over time. I got this pamphlet in the mail literally as I was developing this talk and writing this talk. The DSM proper names for this body-focused behaviors now are hair pulling disorder and skin picking disorder, habit tick deformity, and lichen simplex chron um, chronicus. 
is under skin picking disorder, so habit tick is on the nail, and lichen simplex chronicus is rubbing as opposed to picking, but it's all in the same group. I call it restless hand syndrome. It's a place to put your anxiety in the behavior. So the old term trichotillomania is still out there in studies. You'll see it, people will use it, but officially we're supposed to call it hair pulling disorder. I slip and try to call it trichotill all the time. It's habitual pulling of hair from scalp, brows, lashes, not just the scalp hair, but body hair and facial hair. They, um, part of the ritual is often biting and eating the hair, and that's where the health consequences come in that I'll show you. They present with irregular, ill-defined patches as opposed to the alopecia areata patients that have these very well-demarcated, usually round, complete alopecia patches. Trichotil is messy and irregular. Um, it's associated with impulsiveness and hyperactivity. It's self-stimulatory behavior and is serot serotonergic, I can't talk, and you can use your drug therapy to target that. It can be exacerbated by um, ADHD medications, and that's what this picture is from a paper that a hair pulling disorder started after the kids uh, started um, a stimulatory drug. So you can get a bezoar of hair, and it can cause a cast of the stomach and the small intestine. It's called the Rapunzel syndrome for obvious reasons. I don't think I need to go into detail about that, but these imaging shows that the stomach is full of hair, and they had to operate on this trichobezoar. So it's not a harmless behavior. It needs to be addressed. In the case of the skin, the main consequence is scarring, permanent scarring from the picking, the digging, biting, or scratching with an instrument. Sometimes they use a uh, pencil or a, um, something else they find around the house. Uh, these kids present with different phases of erosions, crusted erosions, scarring, ulcerations on the places they can reach. So it'll spare the mid-back, but just about any place else can be affected. So you'll see that kid at the top has scratches all around the back, but not in the middle. Lichen simplex chronicus is a different response to itch. That's more of a rubbing, and the skin gets thickened. And if they have pigment in their skin, hyperpigmented, it's usually just a place that's very itchy. Probably there's some perturbation of the local sensory nerves that drives this behavior. And occlusion is helpful with the wraps and the duoderm and the tegoderm. Failing that, um, potent topical steroids, and then address superinfection. And this happens in adults and kids with atopic dermatitis without developmental disability as well. Hapidic deformity is specifically picking at a nail repeatedly in the same place to the point where the nail is dystrophic. It's very hard to stop this behavior along the lines of fingernail biting. Um, it's mostly cosmetic. You usually don't get super infection. You need to reassure the family and point out that the behavior leads to the vertical ridging. You can treat with occlusion. If you occlude one nail, they'll probably start going after another one. And you want to spare the patients three months of oral Lamisil because this is not a fungal infection. If you, don't, if you aren't sure, you can scrape the nail and culture it or send to us. So if you address the underlying skin disease that is exacerbating behavioral problems, you're going to make these kids' behaviors easier to control um, and help the caregivers and the child. So there is some literature about using N-acetylcysteine for skin picking disorder. Again, not just in kids with uh, developmental disorders, disabilities, but also in people who have skin picking disorder um, from anxiety and mental health problems. Um, I leave it to the, the child psychiatrists and behavioral people to use the um, psychoactive medications. I don't do that myself. And also remember, cognitive behavioral therapy can be helpful in a um, child who responds to that. And acetylcysteine smells like sulfur, so it may not be so popular if somebody's sensitive to smell. Now let's talk about these rare but important disorders to recognize the nutritional disorders. Um, this is my family, and my nephew, um, who's got the white t-shirt, this is, this is Johnny, and he taught me about the diets of kids with autism spectrum disorder. This is me with my son, and Johnny and my son were very good friends. So John would pretty much stick to Mountain Dew for beverage and White Castle hamburgers for, for solid food, along with golden Oreos that I didn't even know anything about. He would not eat the chocolate Oreos, only the golden ones, not that the chocolate ones have any more nutritional value. Um, so from John, I learned about avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. He would come and stay at our house, and if we didn't have the food he wanted, um, he would not be happy. And at Thanksgiving, I learned to supply what he would eat. Uh, it distressed me greatly to buy Mountain Dew, I have to tell you. And of course, my sister was very distressed about this because she was very much a, into nutrition and um, 
But the problem that you get into is that this kind of diet, I call it the yellow-white diet, will lead to um, nutritional deficiency, both protein deficiency and vitamin, D de vitamin C deficiency. So those are the two things I'm going to talk about. I learned really about nutritional disorder in kids without uh, genetic problems from atopic dermatitis because I published a series with a group of other peds derms about kwashiorkor in the setting of atopic derm where the parents put the kids on fad diets, i.e. rice milk, which has no protein, and these previously healthy babies came in with kwashiorkor, which was from the protein deficiency. So these therapeutic diets, in the case of some of your patients, kids who have a lot of GI problems and, uh, or parents who put their kids on fad diets, um, and just parents who get too tired to fight with their kids, and then, of course, in the case I mentioned, neglect, all lead to nutritional disruptions that can be quite profound and severe. So this is a, a um, case that was published by a British dermatologist who said, who titled it, Think About the Sea and Custard and Crackers. So there's your yellow-white British diet. I think all of the British diet is mostly yellow-white. Um, <laughs> but this child uh, presented, had autism spectrum disorder, presented with bone changes and, and skin changes, which I'll show you from vitamin C deficiency. So the, the child had scurvy. So um, you can measure vitamin C very easily. If a child is on a very restricted diet and the parent's concerned, you can measure that before the child presents with petechiae, purpura, parafollicular hemorrhage, corkscrew hair is the skin manifestations of scurvy, and then gingival swelling and bleeding is the oral manifestations. However, they're often worked up for leukemia and cancers because they'll come into the ER with the bony manifestations, the limp, the bone pain, and fatigue. So you can imagine a child with petechiae on their legs limping with bone pain and fatigue, you're going to be thinking about something much worse than scurvy, which is cured with 100 to 300 milligrams of vitamin C a day. This is a really interesting patient whose mother went to a physical therapist in Canada, and this child had profound um, developmental disability, was G-tube dependent and nonverbal, and the, chi the child was put on a pure fruits and vegetable vegan diet by the mother, so she stopped the, the special formula and noticed that the kid, after several months of this, had a rash. And um, the pediatrician knew there was something off about this rash and didn't think it was normal psoriasis and sent, him, sent her to me. And I quickly recognized that this child had kwashiorkor because I had experience with this in the atopic dermatitis population. So the mother also said to me, you know, her eyelashes are blonde and her hair is getting blonde and her hair is thinning. And the child looks puffy. And sure enough, this child had profound protein deficiency. She had a low albumin. Um, she was shortly thereafter hospitalized for pneumonia. We had started evaluating her for nu nutritional deficiency. And by the way, her zinc was okay somehow. There was zinc in the fruits and vegetables. Um, and so she was hospitalized, and I was able to uh, educate the residents and the team about kwashiorkor in the setting of developmental disability. Um, she also had low vitamin B1 and B6, and the mother was very uh, cooperative and happy to put her back on slow refeeding, and the rash cleared up. So we didn't put her on topical steroids for psoriasis. We recognized the child had a special situation, and that's what I want you all to have in the back of your head. If the skin looks funny, if there's some weird dryness that doesn't look like typical psoriasis or eczema, think about a close um, dietary history. So again, I, I wrote this um, series up about rice milk diets. And by the way, there's not very much protein in almond milk and any of these other um, nut milks that are... Um, on the market now, and it's not just kids with developmental disability that are getting these diets, um, but they may have self-chosen these diets. So this is a published series of uh, kwashiorkor, um, and these are my babies with eczema, but if the findings are going to be the same in infants, it's going to look like flaky paint. Kwashiorkor is a protein deficiency, not calorie deficiency, so they're not going to be underweight like marasmus when they're protein and calorie deficient. They have edema, so they sort of look fatter than they are, and they call that the flaky paint dermatitis. So I showed you a more mild version that looks like psoriasis. This is a more severe version that looks almost hemorrhagic. They'll have both low protein and albumin, so it's easy to diagnose them. And you treat them with refeeding. Of course, we need a good nutritionist to help us. Finally, let's talk about an infant who's starting to show neurologic or developmental um, issues and maybe has something on their skin. And how do you look at the skin in an infant that you're concerned might have a neurocutaneous syndrome of some kind? So skin, there are many, many genodermatoses that have developmental disability and neurologic issues, including some of the more severe um, ichthyoses 
or giant congenital nevi and neurocutaneous melanosis. That could be a whole uh, four-hour seminar, but we're going to focus on pigmentation, specifically hypopigmentation, because it's something that comes up a lot, and we don't want to miss tuberous sclerosis, um, right? So this kid has tuberous sclerosis. That's a Nash leaf macule. And then this is a severe ichthyosis and pig, um, hyperpigmentation. So let's focus on linear, streaky, and um, hypopigmentation, and also hypopigmented macules. So when you're looking at pigment in the skin, you always remember that it's going to correlate with, in the case of hyperpigmentation, with the pigment of the child. So if you have a kid who's got a lot of color in their skin, their cafe au lait macules are going to be much darker. If you have a light colored skin, you're going to have very light tan cafe au lait macules. And sometimes they're really hard to see. Likewise, with hypopigmentation, if you have a child with very pale skin, it's going to be hard to see that. And before they have any sun exposure at all, so maybe you have a six-month-old who's never been out in the sun, you may not see that uh, ash leaf macule until they do get sun exposure. So the way that we deal with that is if you think you see any sort of pigmentary change, we use a black light, which is also called a woods lamp. And you can get this on um, yourself. They're very inexpensive. You've got to turn all the lights off in the room and hold the light really close to the skin. And if you need glasses, wear glasses because it can be hard to see. Look at the entire skin surface. I usually have the mom hold the baby in her arms, kind of pulling down the diaper for me to see the buttocks. So here is a case of um, vitiligo. So um, Noemi mentioned vitiligo is depigmented. You can see how it lights up on Wood's lamp. Whereas hypopigmentation will accentuate, but not light up like that. What about linear streaky or block-like pigmentation? Now, this is a birthmark that can come in the first years of life. So these kids usually present in toddler or older infancy with streaky, whirly hypopigmentation. Um, there's some old terms that we don't use that much anymore, like um, linear world nevoid hypermelanosis is still used. I don't use it, but I've heard other people use it, speakers. We don't use nevoid, um, sorry, cutis tricolor or incontinentia chromacans. If you see that in a chart, it's not my chart. Um, usually I'll use blashcoid hyper hypopigmentation or dispigmentation, which reflects the fact that these are in, develop these are in developmental blashcoid lines. So that's what I mean by that. These are developmental lines of migration of the skin that will carry a mutation across the skin. And you can also have block-like pigmentation. And why are we talking about this in a developmental disability conference? Because kids who have extensive blashcoid hyper and hypopigmentation are at risk for neurodevelopmental involvement, including seizures and developmental delay and autism spectrum disorder. I'm talking about extensive. If you have a localized lesion, most of those kids are healthy. The problem with the literature is there's a lot of referral bias. So 75% are noticed at birth of the first year. This 55% having systemic problems, those studies are published by neurologists, not by dermatologists. There was one study I found by a dermatology group that showed a much lower rate of developmental disability. Um, they have also bony problems, so it's um, not just the, the neurocutaneous, and can have dysmorphic facies. And many of these have genetic issues that hopefully with the microarray, et cetera, whole exome sequencing will start identifying more and more of these genes. 42% uh, in this neurology series had abnormal cytogenetic profiles, and most are mosaic. So they have that selection bias. So here's just an example of a kid who was referred into me with this widespread hypo and hyperpigmentation head to toe. And so I do ask, I do a very close review of systems and we'll send them back to you pediatricians asking for neurology if I'm concerned and ask you to very closely follow development. So I will call this blashcoid hypo, hyper, or dispigmentation. Um, this is the, the dermatology series I was mentioning. It was a chart review referred to dermatology as opposed to neurology clinic. And they saw neurological problems in only 5% as opposed to the 50 or 60 from the neurology series. But they had some extracutaneous feature in 13%. So um, again, if no obvious dysmorphic facies or systemic features, you just follow both their skin and their neuro neurodevelopmental progress. And I will do that jointly with you as primaries. Focusing on tuber sclerosis, ash leaf macules are, quote, present at birth, but they're not always noticed at birth. Use a woods lamp head to toe in any kid who has seizures or you're concerned about tuber sclerosis. Uh, the differential diagnosis includes pityriasis alba, which is a form of eczema you see in darker skin patients. 
This is a patient with pityriasis alba and atopic dermatitis who's African American, who does not have ash leaf macules. Her skin is very dry. These lesions are scaly, and they respond to hydrocortisone and emollients. Anytime you have inflammation in the skin in a child with pigment, they can lose pigment. That is not vitiligo. If a family's asking you about it, that's what they're concerned about. You need to come out and say that it's not vitiligo. But early vitiligo can be hypopigmented. It will progress in a month or two to total depigmentation, chalk white, like I showed you on that picture of the wood lamp. If you're not sure and the family is concerned, just refer them so we can talk to the family about it. Nevis depigmentosus is an isolated macule that's depigmented, usually flag-shaped, usually on the trunk. It doesn't progress. It's there at birth. It has no associations, and it's pretty common. And then we talked about the blashcoid hypopigmentation. Ash leaf macules, again, can be very tricky. Usually there's, where, right there. They usually sort of look like a leaf shape, but not always, and um, look for the other features of tuberous sclerosis, which anybody who works with development disability should know about periungal fibromas and fibrous forehead plaque, and there's some good reviews in your references in the handout. So just take that in for a second, your differential diagnosis of hypopigmentation. So remember that patients with TS can present with seizures, with infantile spasms that may not be recognized by the family. That's why we care about trying to look for the skin findings. Um, and they have a higher incidence of aut autism spectrum disorder, as do patients with neurofibromatosis in the case of cafe LA macules. There's a list of the findings here, and this is an important one. I want um, to let you all know, if you don't already know, that we now use topical serolemus for facial angio angiofibromas in patients with tuberous sclerosis. Um, we get it compounded, it's covered by CCS, and it's very effective in conjunction with laser at preventing the, the disfigurement of angiofibromas in patients with tuberous sclerosis. So bear in mind, we have a new treatment for facial what's so-called previously adenosebaceum. Now we recognize these are angiofibromas. They're related to the TS mutation. They respond to topical serolemus. So I think we've covered a ton today, maybe almost as much as Noemi covered with the Down syndrome. So I understand you may have questions. Happy to answer those. My acknowledgments are to Noemi, my uh, colleague and friend Vikash, and then my teams at Children's. Here's Angela Washington, my PA, my, our new dermatologist, Nicole Kittler, who's wonderful, and she's bilingual. And then this is my UCSF team. <laughs>